Ahmed. I'm Gerald, a PhD student at Honors Group, and I've been working on process memory from a while right now. And today I'm going to talk about several of our current works and starting with uh, some topics that Sugata just talked about uh, related to system support and tools and framework for process memory. And, and this, this, this particular presentation is titled Methodology, Workloads, and Tools for Process Memory, Enabling the Adoption of Data Centric Architectures. So this is a brief introduction uh, outline of the talk. Uh, we have a lot of topics to cover, but gladly some of them of the background has already been covered, so I'm going to go better on it. Uh, so as I start, as is the general topic of this whole uh, session, data movement is a, currently a big problem in today's systems, both in terms of performance and energy efficiency. And data movement can happen for many different reasons. It can have or can be a problem for many different reasons. It can be that the application and does not have enough data locality or especially on temporal locality to take effective use of catch hierarchy of the catch hierarchy in today's systems of or hardware architecture, or that your DRAM is limiting bandwidth. Your application is demanding more bandwidth that your DRAM system provides, or it can be a combination or the both. Uh, and then in the end, you are uh, your application is seeing a really high average memory access time. So current today, computer centric like GPU accelerators have evolved uh, over the, the many decades to include many harder uh, inside the chip to try to mitigate data movement costs, right? So as for example, with increasingly deep cache hierarchies or increasingly complex uh, uh, hardware prefectures, right? However, we have been seeing that this is not enough. Uh, we still are suffering from energy problems related to data movement and also performance problems uh, caused by data movement. And then the solution that we come up with uh, as a community is memory centric architecture, right? Where we move some part, some part of the computation or some computation logic to near uh, the memory chip itself. So we can mitigate the problem of moving data across the, the, the memory hierarchy. And this can lead to the, uh, one example is processing memory, which can benefit from the abundant DRAM bandwidth inside DRAM chips or in shorter av uh, uh, average memory access time, also uh, reduce energy consumption. So uh, I know that uh, we have already talked about this, but I'm going to briefly highlight again that there are different types of process memory solutions. And this is a briefly uh, taxometry. So we have this, what we call process near memory, where we add computation nearby, uh, DRAM, uh, nearby the, the DRAM chip itself, nearby the DRAM bank or a rank, or introduce tech memories, which was quite common to include nearby the, inside the logic layer of, of, of such memories or process news memory, where we use the operational principles of the memory cell itself to do some particular computation. Uh, again, similar to Sugata's talk, uh, there is still a lot of problems that we need to solve uh, in process memory architecture uh, before uh, having fully adoption of process memory in today's systems, right? So again, uh, some of them are the lack of, we need to understand workloads better, which workloads benefit from processing memory and how can you characterize them? And we also need tools to enable the ease of programmability or constructing a complex computation using simple processing memory primitives or compiler support or compiler optimizations focus on, focusing on uh, processing memory, uh, operating system support and runtime support and efficient data mapping and data consistency mechanisms uh, target, all of them target data, the uh, uh, processing memory itself. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to talk about the first two works, uh, the first two problems uh, over here that uh, we have currently addressed or are starting to address uh, uh, related to those processing memory challenges. So the first problem is how we can identify memory bottlenecks and how we can correlate different memory bottlenecks with different processing memory solutions, right? Um, there are many approaches right now to identify uh, if applications suffer from uh, data movement bottlenecks. You can use, for example, Perf or Intel Vtune or some fancy methodology, or not fancy, but some other methodologies that are, are commonly used, like uh, roofline models, uh, and try to correlate what these, these tools are telling you with if application would benefit from process memory or not, right? Uh, however, uh, I don't have time to go through the details here in this talk, but we extensively analyze some of those tools and we see that they, even though they can identify some potential uh, classification of application, like for example, in the roofline mode, you can quickly identify if application is memory bound or compute bound, those tools uh, fails to comprehensively tell you 
if application that is memory bound is going to benefit for a process memory, or if application that is compute bound is not going to benefit from process memory if at different configurations, right? And the same, um, in the same, we observe for other methodologies, as for example, uh, identifying applications that ha has high as level cache and uh, mi uh, misses per killing instructions. Uh, so both methodologies fail to comprehensively identify uh, um, data movement bottlenecks, different types of data movement bottlenecks in a system, and also correlate the, the, the data movement bottlenecks with processing memory suitability uh, for a particular system configuration. Therefore, our goal is quite straightforward, right? Our goal is to uh, create a methodology that can identify processing memory bottlenecks in a really methodical way, and also comprehensively compare uh, how, um, for a particular data movement bottleneck, a uh, process memory system or a compute memory system would, uh, uh, um, would perform in terms of performance and energy for a particular application. So then we create a, a methodology that we call the MOVE, which is uh, a new methodology to characterize uh, workloads and data movement bottlenecks and the suitability of different process memory solutions for a particular data movement bottleneck. Our methodology has two main, we follow two main approaches uh, doing the characterization. The first one is that we use architecture independent metrics uh, like, uh, like spatial locality or temporal locality in order to characterize fundamentally what is the memory behavior of a particular application and the, independently on the underlying hardware. And also we use the architecture dependent profiling tools uh, like for example, less, le less level cache and PKI or arithmetic intensity in order to uh, characterize what is the behavior of the application running on a particular underlying hardware. And based on that, we designed a three-step methodology uh, that takes as input the user application, uh, the code, the binary, and the data set. And in the first step, we, first, we profile the application using hardware profiling tools in order to identify regions of interest that, uh, of functions or instructions that can we want to further understand. Uh, this step is, is, is not necessarily of our methodology. We can skip it if you already know what you want to, what function you want to investigate or if you want to investigate the entire application, right? This is mostly for, because uh, prior works on process memory have shown that um, it's more, it's beneficial to upload particular kernels uh, for a process memory setup. So after identifying a function of interest uh, that you want to further understand if it would benefit from process memory or not, and we want to characterize its main data movement bottlenecks, we use our new simulator, which is called the move sim, to gather memory traces of those applications uh, that we are going to be using step two, and also uh, perform a scalability analysis uh, where we vary the number of cores in the uh, 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 across different uh, system configurations. And we are going to use as a uh, input, the data for this step as an input for our memory bottleneck classification in step three. Uh, after that, uh, we, we, we gather all of this information, all of, all of those metrics that we collect in step one, two, and three, in order to classify the workloads into different classes of data movement bottlenecks and correlate those data movement bottleneck classes with uh, process memory suitability. So let's quickly look at how we, what, how we apply this methodology over a large set of workloads. So we start with step one. Uh, sorry, just say already, they talk about that. So in step one is the application profiling, right? So we designed this framework and then we decided to test it. So we took 245 applications from many, many different domains. And we, as for example, graph processing, deep neural networks, physics, high performance computing, genomics, and many others. And we profile them using a, a hardware profiling tool, in this case, the Intel v to in step one, to select functions of interest. And after doing this profiling, uh, we identify 144 functions, over 77,000 functions from all of those applications uh, that, has, uh, that pass some uh, uh, criteria that we stipulate for functions of interest. And then uh, we select 44 of those applications to up, go further into step two and three of our methodology and a hundred other applications as a validation of the accuracy of our methodology. So then we move to step two, uh, where we use a clustering algorithm. In this case, we use k-means to cluster applications in the, uh, in the spatial locality and temporal locality spectrum uh, into different groups. And then we observe three groups. We observe applications that have low temporal locality. Those are uh, low locality, sorry. Those are the ones in orange. And applications with high locality. Those are the ones in, in blue. And intuitively, uh, the, the closer the application is, is to the bottom left corner of this plot, 
uh, it's less likely it's going to take advantage of uh, a deep cache hierarchy or a prefetcher because it has, uh, does not have enough uh, data locality. And then finally, we go move to step three, uh, where we do your scalability analysis and we collect three different metrics, arithmetic intensity, less level caching PKI, and also uh, a metric that we designed for this paper called less to first means ratio or LFMR, um, the, the, uh, which defined, is defined as the um, numbers of L3 misses divided by L1 misses. Uh, and then we use all of those metrics plus the metric from the step two of our methodology to cluster applications into different six different classes of data movement bottlenecks. Those being applications that suffer from Durham bandwidth bound problems or Durham latency bound problems, uh, L1, L2 cache capacity problems, L3 cache contention, uh, L1 cache capacity, or application there are compute bound. They don't suffer for a particular data movement bottleneck. So I'm going to highlight one of those classes and to show how we uh, did this study, uh, but we invite you to check our paper uh, for, uh, for the discussion about all of those questions, all of those um, uh, classes of data movement bottleneck. So let's look at, for example, applications that are Durham bandwidth bound. So applications in this class uh, have low temporal locality, a high less to first miss ratio, a high less level caching PKI, and lower arithmetic intensity. Since these applications have really high MPKI, they put a lot of pressure into the memory subsystem. And when we and we when you are seeing how the host performance scales when we increase the number of cores, we see that after it scales well until certain points, but when we reach the maximum bandwidth uh, available from our or or Durham system, uh, the application the application performance starts to saturate. Uh, on the other hand, when you look at cross memory performance for applications with this behavior, we don't see a saturation point because the process memory system can provide much more uh, Durham bandwidth uh, than the, the, the traditional host system. So the performance of the application continues scaling uh, when you increase the core count. And therefore we conclude that Durham bandwidth bound applications are, um, are naturally good for process memory. And actually if you look at the literature, those are the applications that are traditionally uh, studying the process memory domain. Um, and is mostly because of the large internal Durham bandwidth available uh, for process memory cores. And we also look at energy, right? So in terms of energy, uh, we see that these applications uh, in this class have high less to first miss ratio, meaning that most of the misses that uh, happens in L1 are also misses in L3. So the whole cache hierarchy is basically doing nothing, just wasting energy. And we uh, look at the energy for the host pin system and the pin system on, over different number of cores. And then we see that the host energy is mostly spent uh, either in cache lookups that are not returning any useful data to the CPU core or to off chip data transfer uh, that goes from DRAM to the CPU core. And, uh, in contrast, the process memory system can completely eliminate or partially eliminate for some other applications the, the energy uh, uh, used throughout the cache hierarchy because the cache hierarchy in the pin system is that we assume is much simplifier then compared to the whole CPU and eliminate fully the off-chip traffic because you don't, you are inside the chip, right? Uh, therefore, you conclude that Durham bandwidth bound applications uh, have, uh, can highly benefit in terms of energy also you know, for processing memory. Again, we have a discussion in, in many other different classes of data movement bottlenecks in our paper, uh, but again, uh, due to time limitations, I invite you to check our work uh, for more discussion. So we open source our, uh, our benchmark suite. So all of those 144 functions that I, uh, from those applications domain that I mentioned, we collect them and then we publish them in our GitHub uh, together with our Damu Sim simulator that can simulate different configurations of process memory systems. And, and over there, as I said, you can get the benchmark suite and the simulator. And all of that is available in our GitHub. Uh, so feel free to, to try it out. So to quickly conclude uh, this part of the talk. So the problem that you are trying to solve here is that even though we know the data movement bottlenecks is a problem in many applications, we still didn't have a methodology that could classify the data movement bottleneck types in different classes of data movement or sources of data movement and correlate those classes of data movement with uh, the ideal solution, let's say, either process memory or a computer centric approach. Uh, therefore, our goal of this work is to provide this methodology that can both identify data movement bottlenecks and correlate the data movement bottlenecks uh, with process memory suitability. The key approach that we take is that we do a large scale characterization of uh, uh, 300 plus functions and uh, 7,000 
77,000 application, and we collect uh, different metrics in order to cluster the application into different classes of data movement bottlenecks. And the key contributions are the OR characterization, uh, the OR met the move methodology, or the move benchmark suite. And uh, in our paper, you also have four case studies that highlights the benefits of the DAMOVE uh, benchmark suite for the studies of problems related to uh, PIN, for example, interconnects or accelerator design for process memory. Uh, so this is the, the part of the talk. Uh, now I'm going to talk about frameworks for processing memory. Uh, before, uh, we keep talking about uh, process using memory here. Uh, so I got to talk about that one, also talk about it. I'm going to explain how that actually works uh, in a little bit more details. Uh, so if you're not familiar with Duram background, so this is a Duram model. A Duram model is constituted of many Duram chips. Inside the Duram chip, we have many Duram banks. And inside the Duram banks, you have a, a 2D array of Duram cells. Uh, the arrays are connected horizontally using word lines and vertical, vertically using bit lines. And uh, bit lines are connected to sense amplifiers that sense the data into, uh, in the DRAM cell. And a collection of sense amplifiers is what we call a row buffer. And a DRAM cell is basically a capacitor and a transistor. Uh, the capacitor is to store charge and the transistor is to connect the bit line to the word line. So this is a really quick breakdown of DRAM. Uh, this is required to understand how uh, processing use memory operates. So the DRAM cells operate using three main comments, uh, activate, read and write, and pre-charge. I'm going to again briefly talk about them. So doing an activation comment, uh, the word line voltage is raised and which connects the, the, the DRAM cell to the bit line, making the capacitor to lose charge to the, to the bit line. Uh, then uh, the sense amplifier is enabled, which is going to sense the and amplify the charge that was in the, the charge uh, perturbation caused by the, the capacitor to the bit line to a, so to the to the to a, a either VDD or zero voltage, depending on how the division goes. And then in the end, the 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 value that is amplified is is stored again in this in the capacitor. So after all of this process happens, uh, the the memory can or the memory controller can issue read and write requests, and in the end, to finish all of this access, they sense, uh, we need to issue a precharge comment with lower the bit line, disconnecting the capacitor to the bit line, um, and and then the bit line is precharged to the VDD over two uh, reference voltage, and the sense amplifier is disabled. So uh, prior works have shown by exploiting this uh, execution model or this process that I just explained of activate and precharge. We can do row, uh, uh, row copies inside the RAM without any hardware support, or uh, majority operations inside the RAM also without any uh, extra hardware support. So let's see how we do row copies, for example. So in row copies, we have, uh, let's say that you want to copy uh, source row A and source row B. They are both connected to the same bit line. Uh, this paper called Row Clone from our uh, work shows that we can, by activating, by issuing a six of a series of comment called activate activate precharge. So two activate two activation activate comment followed by a precharge comment. We can uh, copy the data. So how it works? So first we activate source row A, which is going to connect the row A to the bit line, and then we don't precharge. We, we send the activate to row B. Uh, we basically is letting us since the simplifier is stronger than the the cell itself. It's going to basically copy the, the, the first activation, uh, the, the data uh, reference to the first activation that we did. So from row A back to um, uh, row B. And in the end, we are doing uh, row copy. And there are prior, uh, there are work, recent works uh, that shows that actually we can do this operation here in commodity DRAM chips with some, uh, with some accuracy. And in the end, to finish the computation, uh, we issue a pre-charge comment. Likewise, we can do a, a majority of three operation by following a similar, similar procedure. So let's say that we have three rows, row A, B, and C, and they are all connected to a single bit line, and you want to do uh, the majority. For that, we are going to issue a, a sequence call. Uh, is again a triple row activation, a little bit different than Ambit. There is an extra activation, but because there we something that I'm going to show next, uh, we can do it with a single activation and a pre-charge. So how it works. So first we activate the three rows simultaneously. This is really important. Uh, which is going to allow the sense amplifier to sense the majority voltage between all of the, the, the cells uh, connected to the, to the bit line. So here in this example, uh, we have the majority of ABC is equals to the majority of VDD, VDD, and zero, which is equal to VDD. Uh, and in the end, um, we, we are going to copy back the data, uh, the, the result of the majority back to the DRAM cell. 
And again, we send a pre-charge comment to finish the computation. So uh, this Ambit work that proposed this triple row activation process for uh, majority uh, uses uh, one, of, one of those rows as a control row. So we can either do ends because the majority of A, B, and zero is an end, or a or because the majority of A, B, and one is our operation. However, this, um, oh, sorry. Uh, this is the substrate that uh, the Ambit paper proposes. So we have this is simplifying the subarray, uh, and then we design some, uh, we designate some rows to do the computation, some rows for this, this control uh, uh, logic, or to control if it's an or or, and then you have your regular data uh, rows. And then you do a slight modification to the subarray so we can do a triple row activation with a single Durham address. Um, and then this incurs less than 1% of the area of uh, existing Durham chips. Uh, so this, even though, even though you can do computation, it still have some limitations. So uh, the main limitation is that we can only support really uh, simple Boolean operations. So we can support uh, or and uh, not, or there is, uh, or and, uh, which is not widely applicable for many, many applications from different domains. And also as the, the support only limited set of operations, only this and and or, and which lacks flexibility for other operations. So how I do addition, how I do a multiplication, how I do a subtraction. Uh, and if you want to do addition or subtraction, there are works that try to do it also following similar procedures, procedures, but it requires a significant changes to the Durham array. So we need a frame, our goal is to design a framework that can allow us to do efficiently compl uh, implementations of complex operations using Durham at uh, and giving the user the flexibility to design uh, whatever operation that uh, he or she wants, yet at the same time, uh, without uh, incurring large Duram uh, overheads. And because of, and based on that, we propose Team Duram. So Team Duram is, is based on two main ideas. The first idea is that instead of having data in horizontal data layout, as your data is stored into the into traditional uh, Duram systems, we are going to store it in a vertical data layout. This enable us to do implicit bit shifting operations. So we, because we can sh uh, shift bits by basically copying one row to another and also enable us to use each bit line as a massive parallel, uh, the subarray as a massive sub parallel SIMD substrate. Uh, also, we are going to fully exploit majority based computation. So MBT was basically doing Boolean and uh, operations, right? But right here, you're going to leverage uh, the, uh, the algebraic set of uh, majority computation. So you are going to remove that constraint that one row is a control row and you're going to play it with using the three rows as input at all, at, at once. And this enable us to have higher performance, higher throughput and lower energy consumption because we require less amount of uh, Durham activations to do a particular computation. So briefly how the sim Duran framework works, uh, it takes as input uh, desired operation in the form of uh, and or or not logic. And then in the first step, we generate uh, the majority representation of that particular computation. In the second step, we use new algorithms to translate the majority representation into a sequence of two row activations or activate uh, and precharge comments. And after that, we create a new, what we call a micro program that Sogata also mentioned in his, in his talk and a CIMD instruction, uh, uh, instruction that is added to the CPU ISA. And then during the execution, uh, the user instantiate, let's say, or use this instruction in this program. Uh, we call this instruction BBOP. And then we have a, a control unit, the memory controller that transparently uh, executes those triple row activations. And in the end, you have the end of the computation in memory. So really briefly, I'm going to talk about the steps of the framework. So the first step is to, uh, convert a majority uh, and or graph into a or circuit into a majority based circuit. And we can do it quite naively, right? Because as, as I said in the beginning of the talk, the, we can do uh, I in the operation or, or operation by setting one of the inputs to one or zero, right? However, this implementation of the majority circuit is not optimal as I'm going to show next. So uh, there are prior works that shows uh, that we, uh, by using some uh, optimization algorithms, um, see here I'm citing this work from DEC 2014, we can fully optimize a majority based uh, circuit. I'm not going to get into details how this is done. I referenced the prior works over here. But in this case, we take this circuit that we have in the left that has four majority gates, and then we transform it using this up grid optimization algorithm into a single majority gate, and they are equivalent. 
uh, in this end, in this end, we have uh, in the end of the first step, we have an optimized majority uh, uh, circuit uh, for that to they can move on to the next uh, uh, steps. So then you have the second step. The second step we have introduced this concept of a microprogram. A microprogram is basically a sequence of triple row activations or activate activate pre-chart comments uh, and uh, some uh, simple arithmetic operations or control operations to uh, to do the execution. Of the of the of the computation, uh, so the goal of this second step is to actually to generate an optimized microprogram that can execute uh, the desired sim DRAM operation in DRAM. Be uh, based on that, we have we propose two tasks. The first one, the, the first task is to uh, allocate DRAM rows to operands. So we want to allocate the inputs of that majority breath that we have in the beginning to DRAM rows uh, inside DRAM itself. And on the second step, we are going to generate the optimized microprogram. So again, briefly, uh, we're going to talk about those three steps. So in the first step, uh, the first task take into con uh, consideration the constraints of process memory solutions, uh, which is the limit number of DRAM uh, rows for computation, and also the destructive behavior of the interpro activations. So our uh, allocation algorithm uh, basically assign as many rows as we have as for free compute rows. And, and since the output of, uh, of, the, of the majority operation um, is overwritten, so the original three rows are overwritten by the output of the majority operations, we can reuse that, uh, that, uh, that row for a following up uh, computation. So we don't need to allocate an yet another row, uh, which um, reduces the number of cops that you need to do. Uh, and then in the second step, uh, we take the generated allocation and the majority graph, and then we issue triple row activations and row copies as required for the for the for the for the majority graph, which gives us an initial uh, unoptimized micro op, and then we optimize this micro op uh, by coalescing row copies and also coalescing row copies in majority operations together, which gives us an optimized uh, micro program. And finally, we generalize this of micro program because this is for a single bit into n bits, which in the end we have the final micro program that can do the computation. Uh, this microprogram is stored in the in DRAM for future use, and again, a new uh, ISA instruction is created. Finally, the third step um, is there is no much uh, uh, to, uh, to, to nothing complicated here. This is a simple uh, you can say in other processor that is in the control in the memory controller that is taking the microprogram and issue the sequence of uh, triple row activations to DRAM accordingly. And in the end, you have the uh, the output of the computation in memory. Uh, I'm not going to get into details about this here because of time limitation, but we, in the paper, we also uh, uh, address several system integration challenges that Sindiram imposes, like how to transpose data from vertical to horizontal, programming interface, and many the other uh, problems that this, can, this type of solution can provide or can incur in our current systems. And all of that is in our paper. So we extensively evaluate uh, SimDRAM using the Gen5 simulator against three uh, baseline systems, CPU, GPU, and Ambit, and over SimDRAM that can uh, use one DRAM bank, four or 16. And then we see that uh, compared, and we also implement 16 different operations in, using our framework. And we also use this implemented, implemented operations uh, using seven real-world applications for varying domains like database, machine learning, and graph processing. So in terms of throughput, we see that SIM DRAM highly outperforms the CPU, cannot perform the GPU depending on the number of DRAM banks that we enable SIM DRAM computation, and outperform the baseline Ambit uh, implementation largely. So we conclude that SIM DRAM uh, uh, is quite um, a good framework compared to, to prior solutions and also state-of-the-art um, compute-centric approach. In terms of energy, again, uh, SIM DRAM outperforms the baseline CPU, the baseline GPU and Ambit um, by uh, 100 orders of magnitude. Again, because we are eliminating uh, the, the, the data movement uh, problem and also we are optimizing the computation inside our process memory, process music memory solution itself. And we also observe the similar behavior for real world applications uh, across all of those three different uh, approaches. So we conclude uh, overall that SimDRAM is an effective and efficient solution for many real-world applications. 
So to quickly conclude, the motivation of this talk is that processing memory can be done. So uh, using uh, prior work has shown how to do AND and OR and NOT operations, but this is a quite limited set of computation that we can do. Uh, our goal is to extend uh, this set of computations uh, that can be done and give the user the flexibility to do whatever computation that requires for a particular application. And based on that, we propose a syndrome which is a three-step framework that uh, gives the user the, the recipe to implement a new computation and transparently execute this operation inside Duram itself. We extensively evaluate in Duram and we see that it provides large benefits compared to three uh, uh, baseline systems and both in terms of performance and energy. And that's all for Syndrome. And that's all for my talk also. So thanks so much for listening and I'll be glad to take any questions. Thank you very much, Geraldo. Are there any questions from the audience? Okay, I would like to ask you something. So you have presented a methodology to characterize uh, these uh, data movement bottlenecks. How difficult would it be to extend this methodology to somehow identify when a workload is good for different types of processing in memory? Yeah, this is a really good question. So we, just to give a background, uh, we when you are doing the identification, we consider a processing memory system that is actually a processing near memory system. So let's say we have some logic nearby uh, the logic layer of a 3D stack memory. Um, there is this problem that other processing memory systems have different properties. For example, if you consider RAM or caches or, or DRAM, the volume of the data quite uh, mirrors in that computation. And we don't take that into account doing our evaluations. So even though we believe that some of the insights can still be applicable, uh, uh, whatever we have right now in the paper uh, would require to, to be redone for other uh, memory uh, solutions or other memory-based uh, process memory uh, substrates. Uh, but overall, I, I, we believe that the metrics that we collected are enough to classify also other types of data movement bottlenecks. So take the, the methodology, take the same metrics that we are using, but apply it to another memory, uh, memory technology to, to, to see uh, how it behaves for, for your uh, favorite process memory system. So I guess that's... Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Thanks,